Fragments of a Wartime Childhood A couple of weeks back, I had the privilege of speaking to Roy Ray at his studio, which overlooks the Bay of St Ives. Some of you listening today will already know of Roy and his work, but for those of you who may not, Roy has spent his life driven by a need to make images and objects. Born in 1936, Roy grew up during the Blitz and has first-hand experience of the Christmas Island nuclear testings. Along with his wife Beryl and their family, he has lived in the Cornwall area since 1974. He was the principal of the St Ives Art School of Painting for over 23 years. He has had a long and distinguished career and his art has been displayed from St Ives to New York. He is also a poet and an excellent musician who plays on a regular basis in St Ives area. But it was the events of 9-11 that kick-started a creative desire, which at times had threatened to take over Roy's life. These events have resulted in a project which Roy has called the Evolution Project. It is in this project, amongst other things, which I have spoken to Roy about today. Our conversation also includes some of readings of Roy's poetry by Katie Kirk, who lives in the Penworth area, and Ed Borman from San Francisco. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Roy as much as I did. Dog fights. At school we fight over anything. Marbles, cigarette cards and conkers. These are fighting times. But today we stand in the schoolyard, eyes straining upwards, watching the white vapour trails high in the pale blue sky. Each childlike scribble silently charting a deadly duel. United now, we watch our heroes, the Spitfire and the Hurricane Pilots, some barely out of school themselves, not able to vote, but prepared to give their short lives for King and Country. Well, I'm with, I'm with Roy Ray, and I'm in uh, his wonderful studio, and at the side of me are three very evocative panels from the Evolution Project. Did I pronounce that correctly? Right? That's Evolution, correct. Evolution Project. Yeah. Evolution. When did this project start, Roy? Right? It started back in about 1998 when, in a very casual conversation with my father, I happened to mention to him that my earliest memory of him was of, of him digging this whacking great hole in our back garden. Now, I must have been about three or four years old at the time. And he said, yeah, that was the hole to put the Anderson shell to him. War had been declared. He was going to get his call-up papers any time. And, uh, and he wanted it done before he went. So he did. And we spent quite a few nights when it really got started in 1940. We spent a lot of nights in that air raid shelter during air raids. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought about all the other kids who'd been in air raid shelters on both sides, not just the, us, the British. There must have been kids all over the world sheltering from bombs. Were people just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Mm. We're not talking about combatants now, we're talking about ordinary people. So the idea in my mind grew about the fact that the greatest number of casualties at any conflict are almost certainly the innocent. So I started to write about it. The Anderson Shelter. They said the Anderson would protect us, so Dad built it before he went away. Mum said he worked so much overtime at the post office that digging a hole that deep took him ages. Old Mr Matthews and old Mr Garrett watched him over the fence, they understood. Mr Higgins and Mr French watched him too. Dad heard them laugh quietly behind his back. Dad's away now, in the army overseas. And tonight, once more, I'm blanket wrapped and clutched in protective arms. Our scramble from cosy bedroom to cold air raid shelter is propelled by sirens, lit by probing searchlight beams and Mum's small, ever-ready torch. Inside the Anderson, 
A single candle flickers and slowly reveals the silent, still figures huddled in our bunk beds. Sleepy eyes, now wide open, look up as if to see the relentless pulsing drone that is filling the air. One of ours, says Mr Higgins. Right, says Mr French. Guns bump and thump and the explosions that follow say otherwise. Seven decades have passed, a stirring of the subconscious and the gradual realisation that the smell of damp London clay in that corrugated nocturnal place with its dark unspoken fear will always be with me. And then it also occurred to me that you know, mankind has, has this fantastic ability to invent uh, and create all, all sorts of wonderful advances only to turn them into weapons of destruction. Examples that, of that are absolutely endless. So I coined this word, evolution, and I decided I would make that a project to work on. But I didn't want to be, make it a painting project. Although I'm a painter, I really felt the need to write about it. So I started writing in the form of uh, like, like short poems, just short pieces about growing up in that era, uh, which lasted for three or four years, certainly the worst parts of it. And it was going to be a written project about the places where we were able, not we, where thousands if not millions of people were exterminated, innocent people, men, women and children, by the advanced technology we'd created. And in wartime there were about four places I could think of then which were synonymous with this evil situation. The first one was the Blitz. So I, although I grew up near the London Blitz, Coventry, I felt, was really synonymous with Blitz because Coventry, a small medieval city, was absolutely devastated on one night in November 1940. Bombing raid after bombing raid after bombing raid. And so Coventry seemed to symbolise what happened here, innocent victims. Dresden on the other side, what we did with a fire storm where 70,000 people have still haven't been accounted for. Hiroshima was the first ever use of an atomic weapon. Again, 70 or 100,000 people unaccounted for to this day. Those near the centre at the moment of death at Beijing were just evaporated. And then finally, Auschwitz, where science and technology came together in creating the means of exterminating millions of people, innocent people. So those four names were the subjects of my project, my evolution project. So I started writing. <clears throat> and then in September 2001, 9-11, we all witnessed it on television. Mm, indeed we did. And I thought, here we go again, 60 odd years later, evolution. Two towers full of people who'd only got up and gone to work for a normal day, uh, thousands of them, either being crushed by the towers as they came down or jumping to their deaths from the windows. So here is again evolution, but somehow I didn't feel that um, writing about it was enough. So I thought I wanted to make something a bit more uh, tangible, but not a painting. I'm not inclined towards making gruesome paintings. So I thought perhaps I'll make a sort of construction of some sort. 
and then I got this idea because on the second day of 9-11 they were still broadcasting the last calls between those inside and outside which I thought was absolutely awful and it really really got to me so I thought I'm going to make a construction around this those last phone calls so I went over to Penzance and I went to a phone shop and said can you let me have some old phones you don't need and he said um, well we're not allowed to do that actually but what do you want it for so I told him he should come back tomorrow. So I went back and he gave me a carrier bag full of display phones. So I took those, bits of keyboard, computer parts, wiring, and I made a lot of stuff which looked like rubble and broken materials. And I created a panel, five foot by two foot by about five or six inches deep, solely out of that detritus of a collapsing building that was full of technology. And it took me a while to make it, because I'd not worked in this way before, I'm not a sculptor. But when I finished it, which was quite a, two or three months maybe, because I couldn't work on it continuously every day, but when I got it done, I got all the bits I needed and I finished it, I must admit I was a bit taken back myself by it. And I thought, my God, it's, it's a lot more powerful than I thought it would be. So then I thought, right, perhaps I can deal with those other four subjects in the same manner. Coventry, Dresden, Hiroshima and Auschwitz. So I set about making four more panels. It took me quite a long time because I needed to make each panel not gruesome but as realistic as possible. So you really thought you were witnessing the aftermath. Um, <clears throat> the, first, the next one I did was Coventry. So I made bits that looked like corrugated iron from a, um, an Anderson shelter. Bits of a Coventry newspaper, ration books, kids' teddy bears, detritus of a house, cutlery, odds and ends, bit of a train set even an old 78 gramophone record, which was actually Jack Hilton and the Savoy Orchestra. So all the bits were right. And so I made it the same size as the 9-11. And then I went on to do Auschwitz, but I went to Auschwitz. And um, that was difficult because when I got there, it was November. I arrived in an afternoon and a friend drove me out to the camp which is a few miles uh, away from Krakow in Poland. And we got there, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, but there were some tour buses there, educational visits going on, and it didn't seem right. So we went from there to the museum, which is about a mile away, and we looked at all the, the artefacts of Auschwitz. Absolutely appalling. Mountains of spectacles, mountains of false teeth, mountains of shoes, mountains that they collected from the people they disposed of. And so I got back to the hotel and I started writing about that. Then the next morning we got up early and we went out there about eight o'clock in the morning, just getting light. But it was a November, it was misty and very sombre, not a soul in the place. There were some people on the entrance building, so I said, can we go in? They said, yeah. So we went in and I walked around that site on my own with a friend just following me with a camera. So I came back and I made the Auschwitz panel, which was very, very difficult emotionally to make. So I finished that one and, and then I made one for uh, Dresden. Again, a difficult one, uh, but I have a German artist friend here in St Ives and she got me a book on Dresden and a, a little video about Dresden. And then when she was over visiting her grandmother, who lived through the war, she said, uh, the grandmother said, how is he doing it? And she said, well, he's making detritus of damage, of blitz buildings, just what the rubble that you would find, but he wants to make it Dresden. And so her grandmother, gave her 
a couple of cups and saucers from a best German coffee set is to tell your friend to smash them up and put them in the painting. There they are. I went to Penzance because I um, got a violin from one of my violin playing folk, folk musicians. I said, I need an old violin because Dresden was a very cultural city. I didn't tell him I was going to saw it up, I must admit, but uh, there we go. It went in there, along with a bit of very smart gent suiting, a bit of a, a very posh wedding, bits of Dresden China, not real, but very close to the original, a book by Schiller, a sort of, to try to give the whole thing this sense of a place of culture, high culture. So that was the Dresden panel. Then the last one I made was, was the Hiroshima panel. And again, uh, it, it was impossible for me to go to Hiroshima, but I read up on it and um, I did some research at the Imperial War Museum. And through that I read a document deposited by a youngish Japanese woman whose father was a Hiroshima victim now she was anger, she was bilingual, so she, she wrote this document in English and put it into the Imperial War Museum. I read it, an amazing document, a story of her father. He'd written it himself, but she translated it. And I asked if I could have her address. Naturally, they said no. They said, if you want to write to her, we'll pass it on. So I wrote to this Japanese woman. I eventually got a reply and was delighted to find that she was living in London. So I went to London, I met her, and through her I eventually met her father, who was coming to London about a year later. So we sat having tea in this hotel in London, and I was talking to him, and I was being very, very cautious in what I said, I didn't want to upset the man, uh, but I needed to hear what he had to say. So he was replying in Japanese to his daughter and she was translating into English. And then I said to her, tell your father that in 1957, quite a long while after the war, 12 years after the war, I was used as a guinea pig on Christmas Island for the testing of the first H-bomb, which was 500 times more explosive than the one at Hiroshima. And I survived. And so I have a bit of sympathy for what experience must have been like for you, although obviously not as bad. When I said that, he switched to English. Very difficult, very basic English. And he told me all about Hiroshima. And he said, if you ever want to come to Japan, I will personally take you to Hiroshima. So through him, the conversation, further conversations with his daughter, I was able to put together this Hiroshima panel. And again, I couldn't get much in the way of artefacts, but I, I managed to put a few pieces in there that gave it um, a sort of Japanese look. It, there was lots of bamboo in there. Uh, they've got several clock faces in there. Each one is at 16 minutes past 8 a.m which is the moment of detonation. And yeah, and chopsticks, a Japanese fan, a couple of Japanese tea whisks. The story of that man that got me interested in wanting to meet him was that he was on his, he was age 14 when it went, when he was going to school. He wasn't in the city centre, otherwise he wouldn't have survived. He would have been evaporated with the rest of them. But he was horrendously burnt, blown into a river, when he came to, crawled out, there were people with broken limbs trying to crawl along the roads. He managed eventually to get back to the outskirts of Hiroshima where his, his house was. High energy burned, his skin was like black plastic, shriveled plastic. His mother barely recognised him when she opened the door. She got him in and she tried to clean up his wounds. Now she was a woman who believed in homeopathy and she always kept a big jar of cucumber juice in the kitchen for burns.
as part of her kitchen things. She doused him with cucumber juice. She bandaged him. He went into a fever. She rebandaged him, cleaned his wounds, more cucumber juice. She ran out of cucumber juice. She went to the fields and got cucumbers and sliced them up and rebandaged him. And gradually the fever subsided and he recovered. To this day, he hasn't got a scar on his body. That was an amazing story. I couldn't believe it. And But he sort of retold the story to me, face to face. And uh, so, you know, there was another element of my... It's sort of research in one way, bit, but in other ways, all this has come to me as if there's some um, divine operation that's, that's funneling all this information to me. My friend, the, the artist John Clark, who's had a massive hand in this project. Uh, he's been with me uh, as a friend and an artist for 30 odd years. And he, back in the early 90s, was predicting that my painting would go in this direction. I said, no, John, I don't think so. And he was saying to me in those years, the sort of paintings you're making, you're using scrap materials, bits of wood, I said, yes, but that's not, I like making paintings from the detritus of everyday life. It's another way of making art that I find particularly enjoyable. It's abstract, and you can put your own interpretation on it. He said, but don't you think that's early memories of blitz and damage and bubbling up from somewhere deep down, now that you're in your 60s, uh, and finding its way to the surface in your paintings? I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe he's got something. And actually, I have to say, he's been absolutely spot on. It's, all this that I've talked about has been bubbling up and still bubbles up. Still things happen to me. Um, like, it wasn't that long ago, I walked into someone's pottery and my nostrils picked up the damp clay. Immediately, I was back in West London in an air raid shelter, just like that. Yeah. Another time, I was a few years back, I was walking home from the studio back to the house. And at the time when uh, Newquay Airport was RAF St Morgan, and one of those very big, heavy piston transport planes had taken off of there. It was very high above St Ives and still climbing. And the drone of those four engines, mm -hmm. I was back in that area shelter. Do you think that your use of... Um materials in art may stem from the years of rationing and, and things like that. I know my, my ex-mother-in-law was Italian and she was bombed out during the war and she would never waste anything. Oh yes, I it, can't. It, it, you know, <clears throat> things were so scarce to them and, yeah. and, and, and to people during the war. Yeah. That you would waste nothing. You get a lot of... Um, you inherit from these memories now, I don't know why it is, but I'm now 77 and they're still bubbling up, these mm. memories. And with that ingrained in me is, is uh, what you're referring to. I cannot leave food on a plate. Right. The sort of follow-on from this. So 9-11 was in 2001. In the local papers in late 2001 was the story of, of a man who was born and grew up in Hale called Rick the Scorer. He did his national service in the 50s, then he went up and joined the Kenyan police where he met an American guy, they became friends, and they went to America where he joined the American Marines, something he'd always wanted to do since he was a boy. He became an American Marine, he volunteered for Vietnam, he went to Vietnam and his story in Vietnam is a legend. There was a film came out with Mel Gibson in a few years back called Once We Were Soldiers. That largely is about the score. The most incredible battle where they were outnumbered 100 to 1 and they fought their way out of it. Now, he 
finished with the army, perhaps in the early 70s, did a law degree, and finished up working in New York as the security uh, uh, director for a big chunk of the South Tower at the World Trade Center. He was appalled by the lack of security when he joined, particularly as they'd had an attack in about 1990 in the basement. So he persuaded his company, a big finance company um, called Morgan Stanley, to adopt an escape strategy because he said these buildings, as warfare changes from set-piece warfare in battlefields towards guerrilla warfare and terrorism, these buildings we're, we're working in will become targets. And I've heard him on film making that statement in 1997. So that's about four years ahead of the, of the event. And so every now and again, he would force them to have an evacuation, which must have driven them mad. 2,700 employees all working on high finance having to leave the building because Rick Riscord had pushed the button. But when the day came, every one of them got out before it collapsed. Unfortunately, he went back in to see if there were any stragglers just as the building came down. I read this story and I was very intrigued by it. So about 2007, 2006, you know, a good five years after the event, I thought, I, I think I'd like to write to his widow and tell her of my project. The fact that I've made a 9-11 panel and my interest in her husband's story. So I wrote this very, very cautious letter and put it in the post down on the harbour Monday morning. Friday afternoon my phone rang. It was her. She said, I've just got your letter. I, I enclosed documents and brochure for one of the exhibitions. She says, we've got to meet. We've just got to meet. And about six months later, we did meet. I went to New York and I met her. And then the following year, she came back to St. Ives because of his relatives are still here. And she came and stayed with us for a while in my house and we became very good friends. And I took her to Coventry where the panels were being shown at that time. They just had their first big display at Coventry for the... And that must have been 2010 by then, because 2010 was the 70th anniversary of the Blitz in the Coventry, and all five panels were on display for a whole year in Coventry. So we went to Coventry, and she saw the panels, and she just completely lost it, you know. Anyway, um, I took her back to Bristol Airport. She went home. I got a letter from a priest at St Peter's Church, Ground Zero, the priest whose church was the sort of was the place where the first bodies were brought in, the first victims were brought in. So he was there, part of the rescue operation for the whole of those days when it was happening. And he sent me a letter saying, We would love to have your panels at Ground Zero for the for the tenth anniversary of Ground Zero two thousand eleven. So they they went there. Uh, as a result of that, um, I had to go and make a speech in St Peter's Church on that day. And um, not on impulse, but I thought about it on the flight over, I decided to give the panel to the City of New York. So that panel is now in the National 9-11 Museum at the World Trade Center, when it opens soon. At ground zero. Emptiness. Where once they stood, Manhattan's bold twin towers, icons of the confidence of a nation born of pioneers. Emptiness, where thousands came daily on the subway, on the ferry, by cab and on foot, to the financial heart of this land. Emptiness, where once ordinary people came from Brooklyn and the Bronx, Staten Island, and Hoboken to start just an ordinary day. Emptiness, save for the ghosts of those whose final ordinary day 
would forever change the world and the lives of you and me. Emptiness in the heart of a city, the dust and debris gone, and in the hearts of the grieving for those they never found. Emptiness with distant and fading echoes of ambulance and fire truck horns and frantic calls for help and the tearful last words on the phone. Emptiness, already only pause in the pulse at the heart of the city, not willing to yield to terror or forget those who have gone. Just to finish the story off, um, the three panels were sitting alongside, which is the Coventry, Dresden and Hiroshima panels. I've renamed them the Reconciliation Triptych. And early in the new year, they're going into the permanent collection of Coventry Cathedral. So I'm very proud to say they'll be alongside the work of Graham Sutherland, John Piper, um, and a great number of you know, very serious mm. well. So that's, that's when people will be able to see them. Uh, yes, and that leaves me with the one, one piece, which is the... Um, um, it was the Auschwitz piece which I've renamed Holocaust to make it a more general mm -hmm. memorial and I've got one or two people I've been contact and now exploring ways of finding a permanent home in an appropriate place for the panel mm -hmm. and if that happens as I expected to do early next year um, it will mean that those five panels which started off in my studio in St Ives will be around the world, I would like to think, hopefully reminding people that all those innocent victims of conflicts should not be forgotten. I, I think they will. I mean, I'm, I'm sat here looking at the three panels and, you know, and, and listening to your story and knowing about the Evolution Project in greater detail now. You know, I can look at them and they do sort of invoke emotions within you. Mm -hmm. and um, let's hope that it does sort of make people stop and think. It does. I've, I've um, too lengthy to talk about this during this, this chat of ours, but I've got, as you probably saw in, in my scrapbook, um, quotes of all the letters that have been left from me in yeah. the churches and cathedrals. Um, and... Um, they're quite emotional, some of them. Yeah. yeah, and of course you do have a, a website which I'll, I will give details out for, yeah. so that people can sort of yeah. go there and, and read up on the yeah. uh, on the history and uh, and uh, you know all the poems are and, and the poetry, yeah, yeah. Um, because it's not just um, it's not just artwork as, as, as we know. No, I seem to have moved sideways because I spent thirty odd years, if you like, responding to. The beauty of West Penwith, it means a lot to me. Mm. And that was my career. Exhibiting galleries, solo shows here and abroad. And that part of my life really has come to an end. Came to an end. By the time I'd finished making the panels, that part of my career was behind me. I know I'd done it, been there, I'd no wish to, to go back to that subject. Um, this subject is going to keep me going forever because as I move away from this part of the project into the next phase, um, I will be dealing with um, an era where I really originally intended to start and that was the time of my grandfather and his brothers in the trenches of the First World War. So my project now, and it's already started this phase, is making not large works like these, uh, making small works that tell us something of the day-to-day -day existence in those tre trenches, in those dreadful years, the squalor of it, the futility of it, mm. the waste of it. Um, so these panels, no, I can't call them panels, I call them story boxes because they're like a, like a construction in a picture frame a deep picture frame. So within that depth of the frame, there are bits of detritus of the trench, bits of barbed wire, bits of sacking, bits of small shell cases, 
uh, a soldier's passbook, a photograph of a, of a loved one, and a bit of poetry, all in the one box. So I'm calling them story boxes. And these are my uh, main um, elements in, in this phase two, dealing with World War One. And if your listeners are interested, there will be uh, quite a large exhibition of these pieces in Truro Cathedral next year. That's fantastic. Well, I think next year I'm, I'm right in saying that it's going to be the centenary oh, yeah. of, the, of the start of the First yeah. World War. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of organisations, particularly in the media, who started working on this some time back. Mm. Um, and uh, I will just keep writing um, poems about, about the guys in the trenches, Tommies. The Tommies. Uh, something that always struck, struck me about uh, World War One was you were getting you were getting young lads that were actually underage lying yes. about their age yes. to go mm. to the front to defend their country and and you know to give us really what we have now you know yeah. that freedom and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. sort of liberation. There's a young lad in St Ives, um, he lied about his age to join up and get with his brother out on the west, western front. Sadly the brother came home but the young boy died, he was killed in the last months of the war. The elder brother eventually married and the daughter of that marriage, that's just one generation, is still alive in St Ives. Mm. And I've had long conversations with her. And some of the poetry I've written about World, World War I has been informed by that one-to-one -one contact with someone whose father was in the trenches. There cannot be many people alive who can say the fa their father was in the trenches of World War I. No, absolutely not. Um, in fact, was it only last year that we the lost last the, last, the last time he died? Yeah, Harry Patch. Yeah. Harry Patch, indeed, um, you know, um, which, you know, uh, the clock waits for no one, and yeah. it's not going to be that many more years before we start looking at um, the last soldiers of World War Two. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the clock I mean, will wait for no one. I, I thought about it the other day. I was three when the war started, eight or nine when it finished, okay? In, so anyone who's lived, let alone the soldiers who are much older than I am and are quickly disappearing, in maybe 10 years' time, anyone who has a living memory, childhood memory albeit, of World War II will be in their 80s, mm. late 80s. Mm. Indeed. You know, and so in, in not long after that, there will be, there will be no one who will be able to remember any part of World War II. Mm. So, as you say, the clock, clock waits for no one. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We know where you're headed now in the future with your Phase 2. Mm. Um, I presume you're going to give that a title at some stage. Is it just going to be Phase 2 of the Evolution Project? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's, um, I sometimes think of it, I'm not sure this is going to come into any title, but uh, when I was making phase one, we're talking about all those who died at places signified by these panels. They were the innocent victims of conflict. Mm. I sometimes think the Tommies, the guys you talked about lying to, lying to get in the army, they were the victims of innocence. Mm. They took their Queen shilling, signed up, got their new uniform, marched off down to a place in St Ives to the waving of their girlfriends and friends. They went off to the Western Front, never, uh, never expecting once to be met by that sort of horror. Indeed, horror, horror it was. I mean, you think of the gas attacks and, the, you know, the, yeah. just the, the way they lived in trenches with the mud and the trench, uh, the, you know, yeah. the diseases that that would bring. You know, yeah. a trench fort, you know, just oh. general day to day trying to live and eat would have been yeah. Yeah. absolutely horrendous. It was. It's, uh, and the more you read about it, the more horrific, you know, it, it becomes. And there's some sad aspects too. 
we recognise there's a condition called shell shock. Yes. When your total nervous system and ability to control it is blown, it's gone. In fact, we probably call that post-traumatic stress syndrome, in fact. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Yes, of course it is, yes. And in the Second World War, it was shell shock. In the First World War, it was sometimes called cowardice. Exactly. And they were shot tied to a gun carriage wheel, numbed with alcohol and shot by the coppers. The sad smile. As they entered the casualty station, she tended them all one by one. To her, each one like a brother, like a cousin or a son. All of them, victims of innocence, they'd answered Kitchener's call believing they'd be home by Christmas with stirring tales for all. But not one of them was prepared for the blood-soaked mud of that hell when they left their towns and villages for the place they call Passchendaele. Fighting to gain a few yards of ground in the rain and mud waist deep, praying for a lull and a dry spot, for a smoke and a few moments sleep. Few survived the relentless slaughter, many drowning in the mire, the lucky ones dying on stretches away from the enemy fire. At the Red Cross tent, her smile for some would ease the pain, its warmth not showing she knew they would never see England again. And those who had known only a mother's kiss before dying, as they became men, felt the warmth of love in her smile, though her heart was breaking again. So, you know, apart from this evolution, we have learned something from it. Evolution continues. We're still making weapons that are more powerful. We're still making gases that are more toxic. And we're still making means of, of, of killing people that we develop from our other advances in science and technology. So you know, this, this word I've coined, evolution, I'm sorry to say, is still with us. <clears throat> and it's not going to change. Genocide's not going to change. It's with us. We're seeing... People often say to me, right, you've made a panel for Hiroshima, you've made a panel... Why aren't you making a panel for East Timor, Darfur, um, Sherbanitsa, because the list is endless. Mm. And I say, I can't do that. I'm physically not going to live long enough to make any more many more panels. But the, the whole purpose of my particular group of panels, particularly the first four, take 9-11 away from it, but those first four panels, Blitz or Coventry, Dresden, Hiroshima and Auschwitz, they occurred in my lifetime, in my growing up awareness of the world around me as a child. In fact, um, when I was about six, it would have been, I was going to Saturday morning cinemas. And that would be about... Flash night. Gordon and things like that. Oh, six or seven. I might be six or seven. I was going to Saturday morning cinema. And in those days, you had... Um, Walt Disney and the comic films, you had uh, probably Laura and Hardy. Old Mother Riley. Old Mother Riley, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, or uh, uh, yeah, those. And then you would have a, a cowboy film, Roy Rogers and Trigger. Trigger. Uh, and, <laughs> Met him. <laughs> and, you, uh, and then um, they sometimes left the newsreels running, which wasn't such a good idea because in 1945, I was sat there in the cinema with a lot of kids and they just let the newsreels run from that week when they liberated Auschwitz, the mm. first concentration camp to be liberated by the Russians. And us kids sat there looking at these skeletons, walking in slow motion because that's all they could do, barely able to stand on these spindly thin legs, bones sticking out of their rib cages hundreds of them and other corpses laying in the snow and um, I think 
They should not uh, put those things on with young children. Moving pictures. With sixpence to get in and toppence for a bun, we queue at the Playhouse Cinema for Saturday morning pictures. Soon our small shrill voices sing to the ball that bounces along the words up there on the silver screen. Cheers greet Roy Rogers and Trigger galloping across the Wild West, and shrieks of laughter follow the Technicolor antics of Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck and Pluto. Silence greets the Pathé newsreel, a black and white world where bomb doors open slowly to release evil black shapes that flutter down out of sight and reappear one by one as holes in the moving city map below. Now there are other images of conflict more chilling. Beyond even adult understanding, images that should not confront the eyes nor invade the mind of a small boy. I never thought about any of those things from the time uh, the war finished and I finished with school, in, got a job, went to work, got married, raised a family, eventually found myself down in St. Ives. Never thought about the war, never. And people used to say to me sometimes, oh, you, you must have grown up in the war years. Wasn't it terrifying? And my stock answer all through those years was, well, not really, because it was like every day, it was the norm. And what's the norm isn't frightening. Then, as I say, when I got into my mid-60s, and all this stuff started to bubble up somewhere deep down, I realised that wasn't true. It was terrifying. It, it was normalised. As you say, it, yeah, was, your no brain, it was normalised. Psychology, I mean, psychologists will explain this, but you, it, I imagine one buries it. If you can't deal with it, you bury it. Absolutely. So you can't deal with it. You get to an age when it bubbles up for some reason and you are able to deal with it. And then you think, my God, that was terrible. Also, you know, sometimes... I can't say I've got a fear of the dark, but dark always triggers off some little black memory from somewhere. Always. always. Dusk is worst of all. Because I can now think back uh, to dusk and uh, no street lights. The, the, light, the lights going down, get darker, darker, as trees become silhouettes and gradually disappear. And you think, what's it going to be like tonight? It's tonight the night, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't actually perhaps use those words, but it's, it, 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 you, you, there's a fear. There's a subconscious fear. Obviously. Subconscious fear. So that all bubbles away down in this. Why it comes back at a particular time, I don't know. But it, it came back to me at a time when, in my sort of creative career, I was at to, able to make something tangible that referred to it rather than just a drawing or painting or something. Mm. So. Unusually, you know, um, I've created something here which is unusual to say the least. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but it's out of, out of my subconscious. Mm. Is it subconscious or conscious? I don't know. But anyway, it's come from reality yeah. very deep. Yeah. Yeah. And very, very, very thought provoking it is. And not only that, apart from your artwork, you are a musician. <laughs> <laughs> I know that because I've played alongside you, of course, and uh, yeah. I've had that privilege. You know, in an odd way, this is not totally unrelated to that, because I've lived with this project for, say, 13 years, 14 years, 98, present day, something like that. And <clears throat> as the project took hold and I got into the making in you know, 2004, 5, 6, 7, and then we've been very involved in um, dealing with it and going places, giving talks, writing, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> it, it, it's a bit of a dark subject, mm. but it also um, it created a need for me to, to use my other side because there's another side of me which is not quite so introverted as this side. 
which is the extrovert side of me being a Gemini. <laughs> um, and I've always played guitar. It goes back to the skiffle era of the 50s. It's always been there. I've always had a guitar hanging. There's one hanging up behind me now. There is, yeah. There's always been a guitar somewhere in the house. When did you start playing guitar? When, um, in early, early 50s, when the first rock and roll records were coming into the country, even the first... Just before rock and roll, we were getting the first country music records coming in. Hank Williams Senior. Mm. Wow, still hooked on him. <laughs> and then into the fifth, early 50s, the beginning of the pop era, with uh, the big influence as far as I was concerned at that time, um, was the Everly Brothers. Following the Everly Brothers, you got the beginnings of rock and roll, Presley in 56. So you got Ebony Brothers in 52, 54, Presley 56, um, uh, some of our guys at that time, leading into um, American Rock and Roll, the Beatles in the early 60s. So but I go right back to those days. In fact, when I was on Christmas Island for the H-bomb tests, I had my Martin guitar with me. <laughs> wow. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the Martin Museum would love to see that. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, I played it uh, most nights in the, um, what they call the Naffy, which is like a place where yeah. you go for your drinks, sitting under palm trees, nothing else to do, no women, <laughs> just playing guitar and saying sing songs. And I also played it on the De Havilland Comet coming back from Christmas Island when we broke the world speed record for crossing the Atlantic and I played the guitar at 42,000 feet. <laughs> now, now there's, there's, a, there's a claim to fame that not many people can, no. uh, can claim. Actually. This guitar yeah, was broke the world speed record. Do you still the... have that guitar? No. No, right. No. I had a skiffle group in the... When I was in the Air Force, back in England, I was on a V-bomber unit which is the reason why I got involved in the H-bomb trials. Anyway, I, my job was moving V-bombers around on the ground and refueling them. <clears throat> and in the Midlands, so we'd got down to Leamington Spa most nights of the week in my Ford 8, a tea chest on the back, which was the double bass. Right. Inside the tea chest was a washboard and two guitars. And I think for nearly two years, we never had to buy a pint. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're lucky we get one pint when we <laughs> well I get a still pint I still get a free pint on Tuesdays we get a free pint on Tuesdays and, and but the, thank God to the engineer I mean yeah. everywhere else I play I don't get anything uh, yes. but the engineer yeah. we always get that free pint which is good yeah I think it was Charlie so he hadn't got far have you? <laughs> <laughs> still it's better than the eye with a sharp stick yeah. Yeah. Be, be so, yeah so you know music's quite important to me now because it is the it's the counterbalance to the sort of more solitary um, occupation, if you like, or what I do. It mm. can be very solitary at times. You can't do it as a group activity. No, no, uh, indeed not. So making things or writing about serious subjects is a solitary activity, whereas going down the pub for a couple of jars and playing with your friends... Uh, music you enjoy playing, yeah. to people you enjoy playing to. Um, it's the perfect anecdote, um, anecdote, perfect antidote to that. Mm. It's cathartic. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I'm thinking about your comment a few minutes ago where you said there's always, music's always been there for you. Yeah. It's <clears> always <throat> been there for me, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I must admit, musicians are darn good company. Yeah, absolutely, really, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um, I think on statistically they live longer. It's to do with attitude. Uh -huh. How can you worry when you when you're playing a guitar? Exactly. Yeah. Unless it's your break coming up and you've forgotten the chord sequence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, my my problem is I can never remember my own songs. Yeah. I can never remember the words. I always forget the words of my own songs. <coughs> Covers, yeah, not a problem. Yeah. You just reminded me of something. 
Um, I've been out to these panels on many occasions giving talks uh, about the project. And a few weeks ago, I gave a talk with these panels in St Mary's Church in Penzance. And I had Katie Kirk, my singing partner, read one or two poems for me. That's opened up a new chapter, just having a different voice reading the poem to the one who's telling the story. Plus the fact that I had enormous difficulty in reading the poems. I get, um, I just get too emotional. Mm. So I can't read the poems very easily. So having what someone read them alongside me is, is, is quite an interesting move. Mm. And I think in all probability, I will develop that notion of moving from artwork to installation to performance. Mm. Now, who's, who's to say that that could at some point encompass music as well? Mm. I mean, there are tunes you can play and songs you can sing that say World War I, just like that. Mm. The other songs, folk songs, which say World War or War. The great example I can think uh, I can think of is is uh, where have all the flowers gone? Indeed, yeah. uh, the most beautiful melody and words uh, that encapsulate the futility of war. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have an installation with poetry? And a, and a group so where have all the flowers gone? Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely perfect. So, watch this space. Okay, indeed we will, indeed we will. <laughs> okay, well, I think... Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? I would like to thank Roy Ray, Katie Kirk and Ed Bowman for their input into this project. Uh, also a special mention to Margot Dubois of Glarus in Switzerland for her help and inspiration. Uh, for those of you looking for further information, I suggest you get onto Google and Google Roy Ray, The Evolution Project, or go to www.evolution-project.com. This was an Ian Semple production for and behalf of Penguin Radio in Penzance. Where have all the young girls gone? Gone to young men everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Where have all the young men gone? Long time passing Where have all the young men gone Long time ago Where have all the young men gone Gone to soldier everyone When will they ever learn When will they ever Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyards everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they end? Where have all the graveyards gone? Long time passing. Where have all the graveyards gone? Long time ago. Where have all the graveyards gone? Gone to flower everyone. Where will they ever go? Where